Hey, in this segment, we're going to continue in our series on the characteristics or attributes of God. And it's my passion, I know I keep saying this over and over again, is to do my small part in helping folks to recapture a uh, God-centered view of life and of our faith and to see all of life through God-centered spectacles. So much preaching is uh, through felt needs, and perhaps in the history of the church, there has never been so many false, grinning teachers, um, especially on TV. Grinning heretics is what uh, I call them, and it's, uh, it's tragic. So, um, the best way to counter false teaching is to um, provide solid teaching. And so let's, um, let's dig in. And tonight the topic is going to be the aseity of God. Now, uh, theologians distinguish between the incommunicable, incommunicable attributes of God and his communicable attributes. And the incommunicable attributes are those that he does not share with us. The communicable attributes he does share with us in some measure. And generally, uh, when theologians are going through their list after they deal with the incomprehensibility and knowability of God, they, they deal with the aseity of God. And so let's, let's dig right in. And the definition of aseity, um, you may not have ever heard that word before, is independence or self-existence, self-sufficiency, self-containment. Um, and before we move on, um, you know, I just wanted to remind you that we always have to be Christocentric, too, in our study of the attributes, because it's in Christ, and especially on the cross, that we see all the attributes of God um, come together, as one text says, text says that justice and mercy, peace, um, kiss. Um, but it's on the cross that all of the major attributes are displayed in condensed lucidity. God's wrath, his grace, his justice, his mercy, his sovereignty, his goodness, his love, his holiness, his compassion, his wisdom, and so on, they're all on the cross. And you see them in radical clarity, reality, and compelling beauty. So, in our study of the, the doctrine of, of God, let us remember it's on the cross that that's the ultimate uh, display of God's uh, attributes. So getting back to this incommunicable attribute of aseity, um, I suppose there's no attribute that uh, shows more the difference between the, cre the creature and the creator than the fact that God is self-existent. I mean, he and he alone is the supreme being. He is the source of all other existence. And, you know, the childhood question, um, who created God? And uh, the answer, of course, is that uh, God um, is not an effect, so he didn't need a cause. Um, he's a causeless creator. He's always been. So there was no need. You know, normally, in our experience, if there is an effect, there is a cause antecedent to it. But with God, he's always been there. So the answer to our children's and grandchildren's question is, who created God? Nobody. He's, he's always been there. And... This is something that we, we do need to recapture, is the fact that he is um, eternally self-existent. 
You know, one of the most basic questions in philosophy is why does something exist as opposed to nothing? And if you think about it just for a moment, the fact that something exists, not to mention this vast cosmos, it necessarily implies that something or someone is self-existent and eternal. Think about that. If there's something that exists now, something has to be self-existent or and eternal, or the, the um, only alternative is self-creation out of nothing. I do I do have a series uh, that deals with the different options as far as explaining um, the origins of reality. You may want to look at that. Things like um, self-creation and chance and talking about the Big Bang and so forth. But I don't want to get philosophical in this session. I want us to focus more biblically on, um, you know, it's not so much, uh, like I said, the, the question of the self-existence as it um, relates to, you know, origins, but how it relates to, to God and our understanding of him. You know, we talked about him as a supreme being, and that may be kind of um, amorphous, but we are human beings, and he is really, in fact, the supreme being. And he has being in himself. When he identified himself to Moses, he said, I am who I am. And one way of interpreting that is this notion of, of a saiety. Is it when he was giving his basic covenantal name, Yahweh, at, the, at its core is this idea of, I mean, to say I am, this, the sense of, of being, you know, I am who I am. And human beings, if there's anything that characterizes us, it's change. But the one thing that characterizes God is, is that he's immutable, which we'll look at uh, soon, um, but that he's also um, unchangeable in his being, and he's a source of, of all life. And so, you know, his, the fact that he was self-existing, God, means that he was obviously prior to, existed prior to the physical world. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It makes me think about uh, strict monotheistic religions false ones like Islam and modern-day Judaism, that um, my conception of them is that before creation, it's like God was in solitary confinement, lonely. And as we mentioned in our last session regarding the Trinity, in order for these false monotheistic religions, that God, to become personal, they had to create um, in order to become personal, because at the core of being personal is communication with other persons. But we know that with the, with the Trinity, there has always been a society of uh, the triunity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, there are several things that the self-existence of God um, tells us, and the first one is that as Lord, God owns all things. Um, as Lord, as a self-existent creator, God owns all things. Genesis 14, um, he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Psalm 24, 1, 24, 1. Uh, the earth is the Lord's, 
and the fullness thereof, the earth and all that's in it. Um, so we need to to remember that a, a necessarily necessary implication of God's self-existence is the fact that um, as Lord, he owns everything, and that includes us. Second point is that everything that we possess comes from God. Everything. Now, he does, and the Bible does pro provide the basis for private property and possessions, but in, in the final analysis, all that we have belongs to him. And James 1.17 says that every good uh, gift comes from God. So I'm going to paraphrase James 1.17. Third, I'm kind of moving because I want to make this a little shorter than some of the other ones have been. Um, when we do give back to God, as we should, we give to him what he has given us. When we give back to God, we are giving back to him what he's given us. It's closely related to number two. And um, kind of a uh, common sense notion. Uh, also, um, God owes nothing really to any creature uh, he is the first cause, but he's also the first giver. Um, so, even having said what I did, it is obvious that that our covenant God loves to bless his people. It's just that we once we grasp who God is, um, that he is a God of aseity, of self-existence, that perhaps his um, kindness to us, his generosity and his grace and mercy, once we begin to see how big God is, then we begin to appreciate more and more his acts of kindness, and we won't maybe assume them so much. You know, as one person said, it's the business of God to forgive. Well, it's not his business to forgive. He didn't have to forgive anybody. He did not forgive the angels when they fell. And um, it was a unspeakable blessing that he sent the Lord Jesus as a high priest who was like us in every way so that we might have a way of salvation. You know, there are, um, there are people, and there wasn't, when I was in seminary, one of my buddies was, grew up as um, a missionary kid in, in uh, India, and he was telling me all these stories about um, folks who, what he called rice Christians, and um, that was, they had the problem, as I guess a lot of missionaries do, of folks coming to their headquarters um, just for the literally for the rice or for the benefits that they might get from hanging around and, and being Christians. And that's always a, um, a problem because, see, on the one hand, you know, the Bible does offer out offer up benefits for. Knowing the Lord, you know, we see that throughout. But we have to be careful that that the reason um, the main reason that we are pursuing our relationship with God is not what you know we can get out of it. Um, the benefits, you know, the primary reason, primary reason should be. Um, that we have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with Him through Christ, and which we worship Him and serve Him, and out of gratitude for what He has done for us through Christ, in such a great salvation as it talks about in Hebrews 2, 
Um, and it, yeah, we, we rejoice in the many blessings. It says in Romans 8 that, you know, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him give us all things? So the first cause is also the first giver. He, he, he loves to bless us. But I want us to see, again, just how great, incomparably great our God is, the one who is blessing us. Um, that it's, it's not something that we should take for granted. Um, and then, um, if you turn with me to Psalm chapter 50, we'll see that because God is a satiety, self-existent, he has no needs. Okay, I'm going to be reading uh, from Psalm 50 verses 8 through 15. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or a goat from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world in its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You see the point there is that in so many of the pagan religions, they, their um, offerings were to provide something to their deity that he wanted or needed. He needed to be fed um, in some way. But, of course, we know, and God clearly states here, that he, he, didn't need, he didn't need all those blood uh, and goats and bulls and all that. That was a reminder to them and to us of that there's forgiveness to um, the shedding of blood, which was a picture of the, shed, um, the coming Lamb of God. But they, obviously God is not fed and doesn't need these bull, bulls in order to refresh his spirit. Again, like, uh, I mean, it's still common today in, in pagan um, circles for offer refreshment to their various deities. And God is uh, very keen on correcting any misunderstandings about that. What does he what kind of sacrifice does he want? It's instructive. He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. You know what it was that kept the Israelites out of the promised land? Several things, but it was mainly lack of thanksgiving, grumbling, ingratitude. That's how important thanksgiving is. It was, it was the main sin. And a thankful heart, knowing that God is the source of all that we have, that every good thing that we have comes from God's hand, um, should lead to a humble, um, deep sense of gratitude and thanksgiving. That's what true worship is. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying in this text in Psalm 50, that true worship in God's eyes is not these bulls and goats and so forth. It's, it's just thanksgiving to God for his goodness. So again, God has no needs. And all these goats and bulls are symbols of atoning for human sin. And our worship doesn't meet any needs of God. Uh, our last text that I want to turn to is Acts chapter 17. 
and starting at um, let's see here verse 24 this is uh, Paul's address at the Areopagus and he's uh, speaking to the pagans there and the context there is that he notices that there is an unknown God and he says to them the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place see God's sovereignty there that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him yet he is actually not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being okay we have our being in him as even one of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, so in that um, marvelous sermon that Paul gives there, he again reminds this um, group of people exactly what we're talking about that God is self-existent he doesn't need um, to be fed he doesn't need this that and the other uh, he's the one who is the source of all life and breath and this indeed the source of all being itself and um, there's two things that I uh, wanted to say kind of in closing, and that is that you might think that this kind of God would be isolated, but it's the, it's the very fact that God is distinct from his creation, that he is self-existent. It's that fact that enables him to be able to descend into his own creation, without losing his being in the being of the world. You know how paganism, how the way that they see the confluence between God and the world, they're identified. Um, there is no transcendent God. It's like God and the world are, are the same. Um, but the fact that God is self-existent means that he can become imminent um, without any danger of him losing himself and his being in um, this world like uh, pagan systems do. Uh, there's two things we need to keep in balance in our conception of God and that's his transcendence creator creature distinction that he's up here holy other but then also he's imminent he's close he's here with us he is a source of all life um, it is his it is his presence that upholds all of reality um, every inch of the cosmos is upheld by um, the word of his power and if it were to stop, it would just poof out of existence. And <clears throat> all the religions in the world um, 
air in one direction or the another, another. They either emphasize the transcendence of God too much to the neglect of the eminence, or they emphasize the eminence of God too much to the neglect of the transcendence. And in paganism, it's God is totally eminent. And um, but this, in, in an odd, ironic way, is still unknowable in, in our postmodern world. Um, that's a defining characteristic of God, even with this cafeteria of pagan religions, is that uh, you're still um, at the heart of all these religions, a, a basic unknowability of, of God. And though it might sound kind of contradictory, the very fact that God is self-existent is a satiety, it guarantees that we can know him. Um, his, his being is so certain and everything else is derivative from him. Our knowledge, not only our metaphysically, our, our being is derivative from him, but also our knowledge, uh, all knowledge, but particularly ethical knowledge is derivative from him. Um, so his self-existence, if we were to look at it in depth, it would include that he's the source of everything, our life, our being, the, the continuity of our being. He's the source of all of our true knowledge, everything. And then the last thing I would say is that it's, it's truly wonderful that this self-existent, self-contained God who has been there forever and ever is has voluntarily wrapped up his own emotional welfare, as it were, with our own. He has no needs. He is perfectly happy in his triune self. And yet he tells us very clearly in his word that we are capable of either pleasing him or grieving him, the Holy Spirit. And to me, that is immense and fantastic that the triune, infinite, self-existent creator, that what I do and that what you do actually affects his emotions. I'm well aware of the fact that there's theologians that talk about the impassibility of God. Talk about that. That's his uh, inability to um, have his feelings changed and so forth. But bottom line, Scripture's clear that we can and we do have an impact on this infinitely mighty self-existent God of a satiety. And um, let us make it our passion to put God first in our affections um, in the way that we think uh, and what we say and what we do. And that we might live all of life quorum Deo before the face of God and um, to see all life through his eyes to the end that we might please him. And um, in Christ, he is pleased with us. We don't anxiously work from a stance of insecurity to try to earn our Father's love. No, he, he already loves us. There's nothing that we can do to make him love us anymore. And nothing that we can do to make him love us any less. But we can grieve him. And we can please him. And that to me is astonishing. That the God of the universe could have, um, that we could impact his emotions. Hmm. Let's pray.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the self-existent God of aseity. And may this truth ring true in our own thoughts, words, and actions. And may we see that all that we have, indeed this entire cosmos, is owned by you. And that by virtue of your creation and recreation, you own us. So we thank you that you are um, such a loving, holy God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.